Good evening and welcome to this fourth in our series on the laity in the governance of the church held this week as we prepare on Friday to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council. I am the Reverend James Weiss, a professor in, of Christian spirituality in the Department of Theology and director of the Capstone Seminars for our seniors at Boston College. I am also a priest of the Episcopal Church. On behalf of Boston College and the program on the church in the 21st century, I'm here to welcome and to thank our moderator and panel for their willingness to take time at short notice to share their wisdom on our common concerns. For the last three weeks, we have heard distinguished Roman Catholic speakers looking backward to retrieve resources for thinking about the laity and church governance. But if Vatican II and the ecumenical movement have taught us anything, then they have taught us not only to look back and look within, but also to look around. So we have this evening representatives of the Orthodox, Anglican, and Protestant churches, because what those three traditions show us is that they have retained and restored elements of lay governance in the church which were present at one time but lost or abandoned by the Roman church. It may well be that those traditions are holding in trust something proper to the Roman church itself and that the church can only become the church together with all of the churches. On a light note, there have been times in the last couple of weeks as I've listened to the speakers talking about their dream for the Catholic Church when I've wanted to say, we have a word for what you're talking about. That word is Episcopalian. <laughs> we have a word for what you're talking about, and that word is Methodist or Greek Orthodox or Baptist. So for the, our moderator for this discussion, we are very grateful to welcome Professor Richard Parker, a lecturer and senior fellow at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government, where he both teaches and writes on religion, politics, and public policy, as well as directing the school's program on economics and the press. Dr. Parker is an economist by training, educated at Dartmouth College and Magdalen College, Oxford, the son of a distinguished Episcopal clergyman from Los Angeles, he attended Union Theological Seminary as a Rockefeller Fellow, a former fellow at the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. Dr. Parker has held Reynolds, Danforth, Goldsmith, and Bank of America fellowships. His books include The Myth of the Middle Class, a study of the United States income distribution, and Mixed Signals, the future of global television news, as well as his current project, an intellectual biography of John Kenneth Galbraith, to be entitled The Making of American Economics, which will be published this coming spring. Professor Parker's articles have appeared in numerous academic anthologies and journals, and in addition to Harvard, he has taught at Stanford, Berkeley, the Fletcher School at Tufts, and universities in France, Spain and the former Soviet Union. He has had a long journalistic career, probably most notably as the co-founder, editor, and publisher of Mother Jones, where he wrote for 10 years a regular column on politics and economics. He currently serves on the editorial boards of both The Nation and Sojourners magazine. During the 1980s, Richard Parker was a political consultant and advisor in Washington to Senators Kennedy, Cranston, McGovern, and Glenn. And since coming to Harvard, he has served as an advisor to the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church on issues of globalization. You will find his op-ed pieces appearing regularly, or his articles, in the Washington Post, the New York Times, The Nation, Harper's, Le Monde, and many others. It is a great pleasure to welcome Richard Parker. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. I'm not going to use the podium to stress the relative informality that we hope to encourage here this evening. 
Rather than make a lengthy statement myself, what I'd like to do is proceed directly to introduce the speakers, because I think there's a great deal that they want to share with you in terms of information, and I suspect that you have a great number of questions and uh, opinions uh, that you will want to share with us and with one another tonight. Um, I'll also avoid uh, saying much further myself because I believe in the old adage that at Harvard, uh, listening is waiting your turn to speak, and I'm going to try in t instead uh, to listen and learn. Our first speaker here this evening is Father Thomas Fitzgerald, an Orthodox theologian and priest serving in the Greek Orthodox Church of America. He's professor of church history and historical theology at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in nearby Brookline. He's also chairperson of the Ecumenical Commission of the Standing Conference of Canonical Orthodox Bishops in the United States, and I should note was senior Orthodox theologian on the staff of the World Council of Churches for a number of years. He also serves as the executive secretary of the Orthodox Catholic Bilateral Theological Commission and is a past president of the Orthodox Theological Society and the author of a number of books, including The Orthodox Church, uh, The Ecumenical Patriarchate and uh, Christian Unity, and Turn to God, Rejoice in Hope. Our second speaker this evening is Professor Mark Heim. Professor Heim is a graduate of Amherst College in Andover Newton and is currently the Samuel Abbott Professor of Christian Theology at Andover Newton. Uh, he has been the acting academic dean at Andover and is the author of many uh, uh, finely, uh, highly regarded works in the field, including The Depths of Riches, A Trinitarian Theology of Religious Ends, Grounds for Understanding Ecumenical Responses, Resources, excuse me, for Responses to Religious Diversity, and Salvations, Truth and Difference in Religion, uh, published, I should note, the last by uh, Orbis Books. Uh, finally, we will have uh, hear from Professor Frederica uh, Thompson. Uh, professor Thompson is the Mary Wolf Professor of uh, Historical Theology at the Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge. She's the former dean, academic dean at EDS, a post in which she served for 14 years. Uh, and her most recent book, Living with History, is part of the New Church's teaching series. Others include Courageous Incarnation, We Are Theologians, that is strengthening the people of the Episcopal Church, and her work today focuses on the ministry of the laity at work in the world, and in particular on the historical vocations of Episcopal women. The plan for this evening is to have each speaker in turn uh, speak for approximately 15 minutes rather than ask you to ask questions at the end of each speaker's uh, presentation, I would ask that you take notes and plan to hold those questions until all three speakers have finished. Uh, let me begin uh, with uh, 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 Professor uh, Fitzgerald uh, on my uh, immediate left. Thank you. I want to thank everyone for inviting me to be with you today, especially the organizers, to be able to participate in this general discussion with regard to laity in the life of the church, and in order to raise some specific concerns, perhaps, which come to us from our ecumenical engagement, especially between Orthodox and Roman Catholics, and more particularly, some of the issues, the theological concerns that Orthodox theologians are raising with regard to the church and the laity in general, and hopefully, if we have some time, to just identify some of the very practical places and expressions where laity are active in the life of the Orthodox Church today. I think the fact that the organizers chose to be concerned about ecumenical perspective on this very difficult issue is very significant. And I want to say a little bit about that by way of introduction. The divisions of Christians and the divisions of the Christian churches affect critical issues in our particular church's life. 
In other words, the tragedy of division is oftentimes reflected in issues of worship, issues of ministry, issues of mission. So whenever in our present context we have the opportunity whether we're Orthodox, Catholic, Protestants, whenever we have that opportunity to begin to investigate a particular issue that might be affecting the life of our particular church, I think it's important for us to be cognizant of the fact that other churches might in fact also be looking at some of these same issues. In other words, our Christian divisions created situations of Christian isolation. And some would go so far as to say Christian divisions lead to Christian distortions in teaching, in worship, in administration, in mission. The process of the restoration of unity that we generally call the ecumenical movement is a process of bringing the churches into a kind of face-to-face -face dialogue with each other so that they can look at the old issues of division and try to deal with those issues of division, but also creatively respond together to some of the critical issues that are facing all of the churches today. And I think one of these critical issues is precisely the identity of the church today. What is the church meant to be? What is the church meant to do? What kind of a witness is the church giving in this society and throughout the world? And central to those questions are issues having to do with laity. A little about orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. The formal Orthodox Roman Catholic dialogue in this country began in 1964. An international dialogue began in 1979. And since that time, the two churches have been engaged in, I think, a very fruitful but sometimes difficult dialogue. Here in the United States, the dialogue, official dialogue between the two churches has issued a number of important theological statements. And likewise, the international dialogue has also addressed a number of important state issues, including our understanding of church and sacramental life. But I think we could safely say that issues of authority, issues of authority in the life of the church, have been critical issues of the division between orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism at least from the ninth century. And issues of authority then have a bearing upon issues of ordained ministry, has a bearing upon the role of laity in the life of the church. With that in mind, let me simply identify a number of what we might call theological concerns that the Orthodox have been raising with regard to the church in general and to the role of laity in particular. First of all, we try to remind ourselves that the life of the church is rooted in the actions of God. In other words, when we think of the church, we're thinking of something more than simply an association, a club, an organization. We're thinking of church as a body, a body that is rooted in God's own actions and centered, you might say, upon the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who reveals to us something about God, Father, Son, and Spirit. He's the one that opens us up to an understanding of ourselves as persons created, valuable persons created in the image and likeness of God. He's the one who establishes this unique community of faith that we call today the church. And if you remember St. Paul, especially speaking of the church as body of Christ, as household of God in the spirit, as royal priesthood, holy nation, God's own people. And these very vivid uh, phrases sort of give us a sense that when we talk about church, we're talking about something that is not of our own making ultimately. In other words, it's a reality that is rooted in God's own actions. 
and we are called to participate in that reality. The word church in Greek is ekklesia. Ekklesia means those who are called out. So in other words, those persons who in Christ are called out by God to share in the ministry of reconciliation. So uh, that would be my first observation. Secondly, baptism marks our entrance into the church, body of Christ. It establishes a new relationship between ourselves and Christ. But it also establishes a new relationship between ourselves and those who are in Christ. If we had more time, we would say, well, salvation is a process, a process of growth in holiness, which takes place within this community of believers, which takes place not in isolation from others, but in communion with others. There's an ancient Christian adage which says, a solitary Christian is no Christian. A solitary Christian is no Christian. That's something we have to remember. In other words, there's something important about the church as a community of believers where we come together to grow in our relationship with God. Do we see the church that way? Thirdly, the Eucharist is the place in the life of the church where the church, in a certain sense, becomes manifest. It's the place and the time when we really see the church gathered around the altar, offering the Eucharistic bread and wine, receiving Holy Communion as one body made up of many different people. Fourthly, every member of this body that we call the church is blessed with dignity and value, with spiritual gifts, which assist the body and which ultimately contribute to the salvation of the world. There is no one in the body who is not blessed with gift. That's part and parcel of what it means to be a Christian. So immediately we want to sort of avoid some of these harsh distinction, you might say, between particular kinds of gifts. In other words, each member of the body is blessed with gifts from God, spiritual gifts. And those gifts together are meant to build up the body of Christ. Fifthly, that means then that the ordained ministry, the ordained ministry exists within the body of the church for the sake of the church. Deacons, priests, bishops are set apart for service in and through the body of the church. I like to call to mind a very nice statement from St. Augustine, who I think captured this very nicely. He said, with you I am a Christian. For you, I am your bishop. See what he's saying here, there. In other words, he's saying that every one of us are part of the family, part of the family of God, part of the body of Christ, part of the, the household of the Spirit. We all share that common reality. And yet within that community of faith, there are those who are called to assist in a particular way the members of the community building up, you might say, the body of Christ. So with you, I am a Christian. For you, I am your bishop. Does that help us understand that relationship between clergy and laity? With you, I'm your bishop. With you, I'm a Christian. For you, I'm your bishop. Sixthly, Orthodox theologians like to talk about the important relationship between primacy and conciliarity. That when we think of the church, we're thinking of both those who preside in the life of the church, preside at the Eucharist most particularly, but that the church is also a conciliar community. And there's an intimate relationship between that sense of presiding and that sense of community. 
the danger in the life of the church is when one of those elements gets distorted where we place too much emphasis, you might say, upon those who preside and not enough emphasis upon the conciliar nature of the church, or for that matter, vice versa, where we might tend to place too much emphasis upon the conciliar communal character of the church and not pay enough attention to those among us who preside for the sake of the church. Seventhly, orthodoxy like to talk, likes to talk about the church as a mirror of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. We talk about Trinity as one God, three persons. Immediately we get this sense of unity and diversity. The Trinity is a unity, one God, and yet a diversity of persons. In some sense, the church mirrors that reality. Now I say in some sense, we have to be cautious, we're not God. But in some sense, we as a community of believers that we call church, we're one, one in Christ, but we're also, also diverse in our particular personhood and in the gifts that God has bestowed upon us. So can we conceive of the Trinity as a model, as a guide of the church for the life of the church and the church in some sense trying to minister that reality of the Trinity? And my final theological point, and I could go on and on and on, this is only, how many minutes do I have left here? Five. Five minutes, is to talk about the church as a community of holiness. In other words, we, have, we need to remind ourselves that ultimately the church is concerned with holiness. The church is there to assist us in our relationship with God, to nurture us in that relationship, to guide us in that relationship. But that relationship with God is not isolated from the other relationships that we have in our lives. Our relationships with others, our relationship with ourself, and our relationship with the natural world around us. So can we conceive of the church as this community of holiness? A community is there to help us move closer to God but in moving closer to God, we're moving closer to one another. We're deepening our appreciation of who we are as sons and daughters of God. And we're growing in an appreciation of the gifts of God that we see around us in the creation, sense of holiness. Now, having identified some of those sort of theological themes, which I know some of you might appreciate, some might not, let me try to just turn to some practical considerations. In other words, where does laity work itself out in the life, the day-to-day -day life of the Orthodox Church? And I just want to take you through very, in a very sketchy way. First of all, at the level of the local parish. We see the local parish as the center of Christian life, the center of Christian community. The Eucharist is at its heart. The priest is the father of the parish, but every orthodox parish has a parish council, which, is consist, uh, which consists of elected, not appointed, elected lay people, elected by the membership, the community of the parish. This parish council is responsible together with the priest for the entire life of the parish. Now, sometimes there's a danger of sort of dividing this up. Some people talk about spiritual responsibilities and material responsibilities. In reality, that's not necessarily the case. The parish council, together with the priest, is concerned with the whole life of the parish. Also, I would note at that very basic level that in Orthodox parishes, essentially it is the parish community that is involved in the selection of its pastor, its parish priest. Now here again, there's an interrelationship between the bishop and the parish. Usually what will happen in a orthodox parish setting, the bishop will recommend a number of possible par parish priests, and the parish council, the parish community will meet with the prospective priest and ultimately enter into an agreement as to which priest they want to have serve that parish. 
parish priests are not imposed upon the parish, if I could say it that way. Likewise, within the life of the parish, it is the lay people that are essentially in responsible for issues of religious education, youth ministry, and you might say the entire kind of administrative life of the church. I think there's a lot there to think about, simply at the local parish level. The diocese level, very quickly. A diocese is an association of parishes under the guidance of the diocesan bishop. Orthodox dioceses also have diocesan councils. Depending upon the place and depending upon the history, you might say, those diocesan councils are either elected by the various parishes, in other words, they send representatives to the diocesan council, or in some cases they are appointed by the diocesan bishop. Whether the council is appointive or representative, nonetheless the council together with the bishop is involved in the entire life of the diocese. Most dioceses have diocesan assemblies. In other words, representatives of the parishes come together on a regular basis, usually every two years, clergy, laity, under the leadership of the bishop to deal with issues of diocesan life. So in other words, it somewhat reflects what we saw at the local parish level. I would also say here that in many places, in many parts of the Orthodox world, both in this country and abroad, laity is actively involved in the selection of bishops. Ultimately, every bishop is elected by a synod of bishops, but the selection, in other words, the names that are put forward for candidacy, oftentimes are put forward with the input from the laity. So in many places, both in this country and throughout the Orthodox world, bishops are elected by bishops, but after the laity and the clergy present names of prospective candidates. The most recent, at the worldwide level, the most recent Orthodox patriarch to be elected was the Patriarch of Jerusalem, who was elected probably about six months ago. This election was the result of a very intricate process whereby clergy and laity came together to identify names of candidates for that position. Thirdly, at the kind of larger level here in the United States, what we would call the jurisdictional or archdiocesan level, most of the larger Orthodox jurisdictions in this country, for example, the Greek Orthodox Church in America, has a clergy laity assembly which meets every three years, two to three years, in which laity from the various parishes are elected and sent as representatives to that assembly so that together with the clergy and the bishops, issues affecting the larger, you might say the national life of the church, are discussed. Interesting. Fourthly, the umbrella organization in this country of all of the Orthodox churches is known as the Standing Conference of Canonical Orthodox Bishops. Fancy title. Essentially, it means this is the organization that brings together the Orthodox bishops throughout the United States. The presiding bishops of this organization meet twice a year. These bishops, in their turn, have established nine commissions of the church dealing with issues affecting the entire church in the United States, nine commissions, such as a commission on Christian education, a commission on ecumenism, a commission on mission, a commission on social and moral issues. I could go down the list. All of these commissions contain laity. So clergy and laity come together in these commissions to discuss issues affecting the entire church, and then these issues are presented for resolution to the bishops themselves. 
three minutes left. So with those practical issues in mind, let me sort of draw some conclusions. I think we could say that the actual structure of the Orthodox churches in the United States reflect direct involvement of the laity in virtually all aspects of church life, worship, teaching, administration. This practice is not simply an American practice or an American characteristic. One of my students asked me that the other day and she said, is this just in America that they have parish councils? I said, no. This is something that's, that's somewhat worldwide. Now naturally, it differs slightly from place to place depending upon history, culture, etc. Secondly, I don't want to give the impression that this is an easy relationship. In other words, that relationship between clergy and laity. There are tensions. There are tensions. And I would say this is one of the issues that orthodoxy in America has been struggling with almost from its beginnings in this country, of trying to find that proper relationship between the role of the clergy and the role of the laity. So I don't want to present in any way a picture, of, a rosy picture, and say that this is, is working well everywhere. The structures are generally in place, and perhaps generally the structures work but there are in some inherent difficulties. And among those inherent difficulties are, are issues of how our clergy perceive themselves, how they perceive themselves. Do they really perceive themselves as pastors? Are they concerned with guiding people in holiness, guiding people in prayer? guiding people closer to God, or do they perceive themselves as administrators? And on the other side, issues of congregational life, a sense that sometimes the congregation feels that, that sort of it owns the church, that it somehow possesses the church, that majority rule wins, etc., etc. So, I think my time has expired. I hope I presented with, to you some of the theological perspectives we're concerned with as orthodox and some of the way this works itself out in practical matters. Thank you for your attention. Father Fitzgerald, thank you very much. Professor Heim is our next speaker from Andover Newton Theological. Well, as a Baptist Christian, the first thing I want to say this evening is a word of respect and unity. When one part of the body sorrows, it says in the New Testament, every part of the body sorrows. And my experience these past few months has borne that out, that in my circle of Protestants, at least there's been anguish and prayer and sadness over what has been suffered in the Catholic community. I want to claim the glories of the Roman Catholic Church are mine also as a Christian, as a part of the body of Christ, and I can hardly dissociate myself from the same body's trials. So I come with gratitude for this process and a profound investment in the questions we're addressing this evening and looking forward to times when we will focus more on cause to rejoice together. One of my favorite stories, which is purported to actually have happened, uh, in the Cathedral of St. Paul's here in Boston. Uh, it was a high holy day and uh, the presiding bishop was the celebrant and before the service began he was testing the microphone as we often do and he said very quietly, he thought to the person beside him, there's something wrong with this microphone. To which the well-trained congregation all responded in unison, and also with you. <laughs> and, I come well aware that when it comes to sexual misconduct or abuse of power and trust, no Christian community can claim to be with, without reproach. There's something wrong with our traditions. And coming from one with married and single ministers of both genders, I know that celibacy and a male priesthood are not the exclusive context for these abuses. The spectrum exists in my tradition and all pro Protestant traditions as well. But our focus this evening is on laity in the church, and the questions before us are whether there are ways 
of reforming and refiguring the place of the laity in the church that would help us address crises like this current one and some of the structures and systems that if they don't foster those kinds of violations still allow them to occur. There's no lack of diagnoses, I know, for what the problem might be. Clericalism, unaccountable forms of hierarchy, a theology about scandal in the church, depending upon who you're listening to, either isolated and unrealistic priestly formation or permissive and lax ones. But I think the most useful thing I could do this evening is not so much the kibitz from the sidelines about the particular aspects of Protestantism that ought to be prescribed as cures for Roman Catholic ills. Rather, I'd like to offer you a perspective from a tradition that doesn't lack for its own problems, but it may at least give you some sense of contrast, like taking a break from the distress of a stomach virus for a brief spot of extreme toothache. <laughs> I stand in a community almost as far removed from the Roman Catholic Church on this topic as it's possible to be. And I'm sure that despite the present crisis, there's no danger that Roman Catholics will in large numbers by acclamation rush to adopt Baptist ecclesiology. <laughs> but a view from the other side of the fence may be helpful as you consider empowerment of the laity and perhaps even to see certain benefits in your situation that, from my standpoint at least, are obvious. I know that at the moment, laity in the Roman Catholic Church are struggling in a very concrete way to have their voice heard around very particular issues. And I trust and I have faith that that certainly is going to happen in the relatively short term around practical issues. My concern is more about the long-term questions of lay empowerment, lay participation, lay involvement in the church. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of Baptist ecclesiology. I hope not too much. Uh, when you, if you go to a Baptist church, you'll often find a, a little tract, a little list that, that has Baptist distinctives. We like to think we're so special. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing in this list that's unique to Baptists by itself. But the list is something like authority of scripture, believer's baptism for adults, regenerate church membership, priesthood of all believers, soul freedom or soul liberty, congregational autonomy, religious freedom. Now in fact, all of those things grow out of something more fundamental, more basic. It's a way of understanding how to be church. And the best way I think to think about this is to ask how is it that we maintain the continuity and identity of our life as Christians in the church. The church East and West has agreed that the basis for that continuity is already given to us. It's given in scripture and in tradition. There is a given written normative text and there are normative elements of tradition, creeds, lit liturgies, writings of authoritative teachers, and there's an, a living authority in the church that interprets these things, applies them to our situation, a magisterial teaching office, in the bishops particularly, and in the West, in the papacy. So if the church is built around these things, the question arises, how do we know that we are carrying them on authentically, truly, faithfully, apostolically, how are we maintaining our consistency, our identity, our faithfulness from one church to another, from one age to the next, from one place to another? That teaching and governing authority is usually specialized in the clergy more than the laity. But what I'd like to suggest this evening is that what's true of every Christian community and tradition is that it has what I would call reservoirs places where it stores its reference points for this identity and this continuity. And there are several kinds of these reservoirs. As I say, there's the office and the teaching role of the bishops and of the pope. There's a cumulative tra tradition of great teachers and doctors in the church, theologians and leaders. There are the creeds and confessions of the church. There are fixed liturgical forms and prayers there's a sacramental and a learned ministry, a priesthood. There's covenants in congregational life, 
All of these things are ways in which Christian communities, you might say, store the deposit of faith for this purpose of identity and continuity. With the Reformation, Protestants challenged the existing view of the church with a somewhat different one. They wanted two fundamental changes in this picture. That is, they challenged the accumulated authority of tradition, saying it should not be equal to that of scripture, and they challenged the idea of a magisterial teaching office in the way in which it had been received to that point, particularly as embodied in bishops. Now, in arguing for scripture alone, as they sometimes said, Protestants were mainly attacking these particular kinds of reservoirs. They thought it was possible to return again and again to scripture for the first time, you might say, to take guidance from it, to apply it in communities. And that in principle, each person, lay or ordained, secular or religious, could do this. So the definition of the church as the place where the word is rightly preached and the sacraments are rightly celebrated assumed that you could tell where that was happening, that is where the word was being rightly preached, where the sacraments were rightly being celebrated by reference to scripture as an authority. Now already during the Reformation, the classic argument against this approach and, the, and a sound argument was already clearly raised and that is scripture alone if that's your standard, surely it's obvious people won't agree about what scripture says. And then how will you settle those disagreements? Reformers saw the problem and they had answers. The answers tended to revolve around three elements that they had not jettisoned or attacked. Creeds, liturgy, and a learned ministry. And the three branches of the so-called magisterial reformation, that is Lutheran, Reformed, Anglican, all have confessional formula, which they maintained as a kind of continuity with tradition. Not only the Nicene and Apostolic creeds, but particular ones, like the Augustana Confession or the Westminster Confession. Now, they take these things as expressive of the authority of scripture, consistent with it, but they use them as a test case, as a way of guiding the community. They also had normative liturgies. Perhaps the best example was the Book of Common Prayer. Here there's a fixed form of what they took to be scriptural worship on the principle that it's a drive from scripture, but still it's maintained in a fixed form. And by use and adherence to this liturgy, one can make sure that the the liturgical life, the spiritual life of the church is being maintained. And in some churches you can change theology, you can mess with governance, but you better not touch the liturgy. And that, that rests in a sound insight. The way that we pray is the way that we believe and live. The third element, the learned ministry. Everyone is capable of under, interpreting scripture, they believed, but it was important that there be some people who were well trained and prepared intellectually and spiritually for the task of interpretation. So there was a special role for the minister, not necessarily as a sacramental figure, but as an interpreter and teacher. Now, this was a different way of being church. In my particular tradition, Baptists along with a few others took this a few steps further we might say they went too far from many perspectives. Baptists agreed with the critiques of the magisterial teaching authority and cumulative tradi tradition, but they also dropped things that the reformers had thought were necessary. The three elements I just mentioned, creeds, a fixed liturgy, a learned ministry. Our cousins, the Congregationalists, took a similar tack but they couldn't quite give up the learned ministry. They held on to that one. Now Baptists faced the same criticism from Protestants that Protestants had faced from Catholics, which was the short form, are you crazy? <laughs> Baptists were also aware of the problem to say scripture alone doesn't resolve differences. 
And if you don't have creeds or a fixed liturgy or a teaching office or a learned ministry to resolve those problems, how are you going to maintain identity, faithfulness, and continuity? Baptists proposed that the way to do this was to have the local congregation be the primary determinative interpretive instrument in understanding scripture. If you want to know what it means, what it teaches, the best way to proceed is for a small community of regenerate believers who know each other face to faith, face and are committed to each other, covenanted together, to have them pray and counsel and seek God's will. They thought this was the situation in which the Holy Spirit could speak and be heard most freely. Now, the Quakers went even a step further than this and did away with instrumental helps like ordained ministry, even. What I'm trying to point out is all the things I mentioned earlier flow from this basic idea of how to be the church. Baptists were aware that this could not possibly work. It could not possibly work unless you had a very unusual kind of community. If you were going to have not bishops, not fixed creeds, not fixed liturgy, not a learned ministry, but only the gathered community of believers, it would have to be a carefully composed gathered community of believers, disciplined, covenanted, committed. Only people who had entered it voluntarily by personal confession, by testimony of God's work and experience in their lives, could hope to live out this way of being the church. Because in this church, even the ordained have no distinctive role outside the local congregation. In all the bodies of the church, of the Baptist communion, in every one of them, from the local congregation on, clergy are a minority. And the decisions are made by voting, and the laity hold always the majority, whether it's the local church, a regional group, a state convention, a national body. So all of these particular elements, believer's baptism, regenerate church membership, congregational autonomy, they all flow from this idea of being the church in a way that depends completely on the laity as the authoritative teachers and interpreters in the church. And this idea of soul liberty, which is that each individual has the capacity, indeed has the vocation, to interpret scripture themselves independently by the leading of the spirit, and that they need to bring in conscience that conviction to the body for their discernment and discussion. That idea doesn't arise out of, the, of, of a, an abstract love of democracy, or as some Baptists, I'm afraid, would have it, out of an affection for my own opinion. No one has a right to tell me what to believe. You find that a good deal among Baptists, too. It arises from this need to open a channel for the Holy Spirit to speak to the church. And the idea is that it can speak to the church best if we listen each individually, prayerfully, carefully, and then share those discernments and try to see the leading of the Spirit for the community. So where there are special organs and authorities in most church groups to guide the community, for Baptists, the community itself has to be that organ. The Baptist model of the church has no overarching structure of governance. There's no doctrine or authority that can set a limit to how diverse people can be in their opinions or, the, or in their activities in a local congregation. The limit is set by the communities, the local congregations' capacity to live as a vital, faithful, functioning community. Now, why have I subjected you to all this about Baptists? Maybe more than you want to know. Well, because I think that as in the Roman Catholic communion, you move toward efforts to formulate roles for laity in a very different ecclesial context, in a different ecclesial structure, it might be useful to think about some of these elements that are in play in what I would call a radical experiment. It's what the Baptist tradition is. It's a radical ongoing experiment as to whether you can do it with that little visible means of support. With the laity as the primary carriers 
of that content, that deposit of faith, that apostolic teaching, that interpretation of scripture. Now, I'm sure that some aspects of this picture appeal to you. The congregation's right to call and choose its own minister and discipline its own leadership and to elect its own lay leaders. The relation of church leaders of associations and conventions who serve at the pleasure of the elected representatives of congregations. But there are other things in this model that, that you probably have noticed and I would frankly confess to you and that is the weakness of a sense of the universal church in this structure, a thin sacramentality, a lack of depth of tradition, a liability to spin out of control in the local congregation, a tendency toward separation when the problems become irrevocable or someone the only solution is to become two different communities and a sectarian focus on the community itself and its composition. So as I say, I'm frank to tell you there are problems with this approach where the laity become so centrally empowered. The question I put before you is how can you reap some of these same benefits and remain consistent with what I regard as the Catholic genius? One of my friends, an Episcopal priest, I'm not picking on Episcopalians particularly this <laughs> evening, but was pointing out to me the, the glory of this approach by saying, you know, in her congregation on a Sunday morning, she's not sure that the majority of the people there actually believe any of this. <laughs> but she said, that's fine because they can't change the liturgy. The liturgy is here and given and will continue. The, the ministers have been vetted carefully and, and they have to meet certain kinds of standards of practice. And there's, there's creeds and confessions adopted by the church and there's the leadership of bishops and so on. So the faith is not in danger. People can come and warm their hands at it until they've been transformed and converted and renewed by it. In a Baptist congregation, everything could change from this week to the next week depending upon who the people are who make up that community. So there are great benefits in not being quite that far on the spectrum. It means that a local parish can be as open to visitors and outsiders as possible because the deposit is clear and firm. It means in the relation with other religions, Catholics have shown this extraordinary openness toward enculturation and dialogue because again, the borders can be more open when the center is so firmly defined. And in my own tradition, it's often the reverse. And last of all, just a few concrete observations. For laity to exercise a greater voice in the church's life, we have to become clearer about who laity are. It's an office and who holds it. In Baptist churches, this becomes the crucial question. Becoming a member is the most important decision that's made and the sharpest line that's drawn. For laity organizations, that's going to be a question that has to be addressed too. For laity to speak collectively, what's the appropriate organ? For us, it's the congregation itself, but that can't be quite right, I don't think, in the Catholic tradition. Are there limits to what the laity's voice and responsibility covers? Is there some dimension of the church's teaching and deposit of faith that's to be reserved from the laity's decision making? What part, how, and why? And finally, I would say there's a need for a spirituality of governance. Father Cunin, a couple of weeks ago, spoke about baptism as the sort of ordination of laity for ministry and service in the church. In my own tradition, we take that with absolute seriousness because there really are no ministers in our church except those who are members by baptism, by ordination to take a role in the guidance and direction of the church. But that requires a formation absolutely parallel to priestly formation or ministerial formation for the laity to exercise that role. It requires a kind of discipline to take on these tasks. And these are issues I think that increasingly groups of Catholic lay people will need themselves to discern and organize. I know that Baptists were sometimes analogized in their early history to religious orders. 
people said it's really like a religious order. There's, you join it by a vow of commitment. There's complete kind of sharing of uh, resources within it. And I think there's a, there's a model there in a way too for the path of Catholic laity in the future to develop their own kind of spiritual charism, their own kind of structure, their own kind of participation in a unique and distinct way, not like those of any of our other traditions, and yet gathering some of the, some of the insights that have been shared here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Heim. Uh, next, Professor uh, Frederica Thompson of the Episcopal Divinity School of Cambridge. I thought I'd start by quoting one of my favorite saints, Saint Pogo. <laughs> if you don't know where you're going, you're likely to end up somewhere else. Here's where I'm going. I'm going from the present to the past, and I'm going to talk about the authority of the laity in governance as an essential principle. There are many books titled The Authority of the Laity in my um, Johnny-come-lately denomination, and they've drawn much from the wisdom of the Reformation movement and our Catholic inheritance, for which I'm grateful. What I want to argue tonight is the authority of the laity is a key principle within my polity, the Episcopal polity, that from the, from the beginning, and it is a principle worth fighting for. And I want to share with you seven, just happen to be seven, I know it's a magical number, seven principles that undergird the reality of the authority of the laity and the governance of the Episcopal Church. The first, starting with the beginning, and if I had had it with me, I would hold up the prayer book our law of worship, of liturgy, our law of praying shapes our law of believing. And that prayer book, thanks to a good number of Roman Catholic, Orthodox, and other scholars, was um, reconstructed and reformed in 1979. And at the back of the book is something called the Outline of the Faith. Some Protestant friends might know that as a, as a uh, catechism, and Catholics as well. And it asks this question, who are the ministers of the church? It's a good question. Who are the ministers of the church? And the answer is, the ministers of the church are laypersons, bishops, priests, and deacons. Note the order. The ministers of the church are laypersons, bishops, priests, and deacons. Ministry shapes governance. That is the principle that comes through our prayer book liturgies and our definitions of the outline of our faith. We are baptized into the mission of God, and the ministry flows from that. Like our Baptist friends, though we do it typically at a younger age, because in our view, baptism represents and recognizes God's act in creation. We're not about saving evil children were about recognizing as a body of faithful people that God has already acted and acknowledging that sacramentally. In our baptism, we're laden then with God's spirit and energy. So Americans think baptism is only an individual choice. I would suggest that any sacramental action is God acting and the community responding. So baptism interprets our gifts for mission and ministry. The second corollary principle is related to the first. If the first is ministry shapes governance, the second is religious authority comes with baptism. Religious authority comes with baptism. It's nurtured by prayer, worship, Bible study, life together, and the requisite adult training uh, and schooling that is uh, evident in many of our parishes. There's a great woman named Verna Dozier, an African-American um, scholar and writer who has written a book well worth reading. It's a pamphlet, really, but, you know, pamphlets like Luther's 95 Thesis, they have a way of saying things kind of sharply and clearly. Verna's book is called The Authority of the Laity. I recommend it to you. 
She also has a book called The Calling of the Laity. And she says this in, in response to the issue of religious authority. Religious authority is of God. Human beings do not give it. Human beings cannot take it away. Sinful human beings, however, can surrender it. Sinful human beings, however, can surrender it. In the language of my Episcopal and Anglican friends, and I'll talk primarily about the Episcopal Church and then with some reflections on what happens worldwide. In the language of my Episcopal and Anglican friends, baptism is our primary identity. As one of our liturgists insists, Christians do not ordain to the royal priesthood, they baptize to it. They do not ordain to the royal priesthood. First Peter, go through all those other readings uh, that name who the people of God are, the people of God being the most frequent definition for the church uh, in Hebrew scripture and the New Testament. Baptism is our primary identity. Christians do not ordain to priesthood, they baptize to it. Which led a little later on in this country to the saying among those women, good friends and colleagues of mine who were hoping with men supporting them to be ordained, either stop baptizing them or start ordaining them. So, ministry shapes governance, religious authority comes with baptism and ongoing prayer, worship, Bible study, and learning and life together. Third principle, two historical principles come from the fact that the American Episcopalians um, had some historic peculiarities in their foundational life in this country. Councils, we call them conventions, other peoples call them synods, are shaped in the Episcopal Church by Republican political ideals in which the voice of the laity is required. This is not surprising when the Episcopal Church was organizing itself out of the colonial American experience. It was shaped by a number of folks who had been helping to write the Constitution. In fact, the lead character uh, advising the Episcopalians was the chaplain to the Continental Congress. And he was the one who helped draft the early polity and governance of the American Episcopal Church. And what's more, in colonial America, um, Anglicans held most of the power. There's no question about that. Anglicans, excuse me, Anglican laity held most of the power. Clergy were, they showed up and performed nicely, we hope. But most of the power, the land, the money, etc., uh, was held by the laity. So the, uh, the principle of councils or conventions or large gathering decision-making bodies in which the voice of the laity is central is an historic action. In 1784, when the Episcopal Church had its first informal convention, it wrote that to make canons there be no other authority than a representative body of clergy and laity conjointly assembled. That is, to pass church laws, canons, there be no other authority than a representative, catch that word, body of clergy and laity conjointly assembled. The die was cast. Clergy and laity would not meet separately. They would meet together. They had, by the way, been meeting separately in the, uh, in the Church of England. And the first house established, the first house of convention, the first house of the synod established in this country was the house of clerical and lay deputies. I have been privileged to sit in that house and we always say we are the senior house. Uh, long before there was agreement on what bishops would do in the Episcopal Church, catch the language there, there was a house of clergy and lay deputies that was meeting nationally. And again, our figures were closely related to the ideals of the Republican movement in this country. The second principle at work uh, in, involved in shaping this American Episcopal Church was that context counts. The church, the provincial church, the local church, the national church will be different. Diversity and difference are to be expected. It comes back from the English inheritance, which wrote in 1571, 
Every particular or national church hath authority to ordain, change, or abolish ceremony, ceremonies or rites of the church ordained only by man's authority, so that all things be done to edify. So every national church, every body, every nation has the right to change, abolish, or ordain ceremonies or rites. This gives us, for example, in the U.S., the advantage of going ahead and ordaining women before Anglicans throughout the globe had agreed upon that. In 2001, an international meeting of Anglicans from the Caribbean, Africa, and Latin America had a similar statement. Bishops and dioceses work in radically different contexts always in creative dialogue and tension with whatever culture they call their own. So there's a certain provisionality built into each, if you will, national church's structure. The context of each church, national church, large church, is important. If I said the first historical principle was the establishing of a conjoint meeting of clergy and laity, the second historical principle my fourth in all, is that if there are to be bishops in the Episcopal Church, they are to be bishops by ballot. That's the title of a famous book describing how we got bishops in the Episcopal uh, establishment. Bishops by ballot. Episcopacy, Episcopacy, let's face it, was first seen as a stumbling block to unity uh, as the colonies emerged into the Republican area. It was too associated with royalty and the trappings of royalty. Um, it was too associated with the divine right of kings, or the suggests the divine right of bishops. Um, the Americans felt there was no need for potentially domineering bishops. No need for them. And there were problems about getting bishops consecrated, since we were at that point having a war with England. <laughs> So a certain, and you know, five million books follow describing all of that. Um, but still, if there were to be bishops at all, they are to be bishops by ballot. In 1789, five years after the senior house, the House of Clergy and Lay Deputies was established, the General Convention adopted a constitution which allowed a house of bishops to meet. It did not have veto power. It was to meet every time the House of Clergy and Lay Deputies met, a bicameral, does this sound familiar? A bicameral situation. Um, and American bishops were in every way more democratic than their English counterparts at the time. They weren't to dress up fancy, they weren't to carry a crozier, they weren't to have an exaggerated title, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've caught up to the purple and the crozier. Thank you for keeping those things alive. Our, our, our men and women have things, and our women, to look great in. <laughs> um, bishops were to, with their clergy and laity, gather in convention. And in the absence of a bishop functioning in the diocese, a standing committee of elected, equal numbers of elected clergy and laity are the constitutional authority in the diocese. I'm currently a member of the Standing Committee of the Diocese of Massachusetts. I am elected. Something goes wrong, I can say, I have won one of eight votes for clergy, for laity, um, what steps might be taken. So we have this uh, national meeting of a bicameral house, clergy and laity and bishops. They both have to pass legislation. They both have to agree. They don't have veto power over the other. They both have to approve the person that we used to call the presiding bishop, the person who was going to preside over the house, usually the senior in terms of appointment. Now we've learned other terms like primate that have crept in. Why, I don't know, but there it, there it is. So that's my uh, two historical points on clergy and laity and bishops by ballot, bishops that are elected by clergy and laity representatives involved in all aspects and approved by clergy and laity representatives. If uh, someone in Connecticut elects a bishop, I as a standing committee member have to sign the approval of that uh, in, in Massachusetts for Pennsylvania. 
My fifth principle, trusting the laity in governance means, rather belatedly, trusting the authority of all the laity. You might expect me to say something like that. There's a long struggle to claim the full participation of the laity in the Episcopal Church. Women's voice and vote were only heard in convention in 1970. 1970. Episcopal women were th for the first time allowed to have voice and vote in general convention. It was the longest battle. The battles for ordination were somewhat shorter. In 1970, the first resolution to get women to have voice and vote in convention came up, as one might expect, in 1919, when suffrage passed. It took us over 50 years to get that voice and vote. Guys didn't want to give up their seat. It's not surprising. The same convention that approved women with voice and vote as lay deputies turned down the ordination of women to the priesthood and episcopate. But it passed the admission of women as deacons, deaconesses. Women who had served before were now able to be called deacons with the title the reverend. And as a friend of mine, Sue Hyatt, a faculty colleague recently deceased, uh, and one of the early Episcopal priests once remarked, with that action, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> so 1970, and this is a warning and this is a truth, you know, how do you get the toothpaste back in the tube after you have admitted men and women to leadership and authority in the church, and mine, a uh, sacramental church that appreciates um, the office and leadership of bishops as long as that office is exercised. Uh, with clergy and laity. Six point. Episcopal governance exhibits tensions over the authority of clergy and laity. We have not solved it all. In our diocesan conventions, all clergy vote, but only proportional representatives from parishes. There is a reform move afoot in uh, parishes that are somewhat smaller than Massachusetts, which is the largest in the Episcopal Church, in which all members of the church, all baptized, admitted members of the church are allowed to vote. There's a tension there. There's a tension between what is called a church that is Episcopal, Episcopally led and synodically governed, led by bishops, but responding to and dependent upon the budgets, the actions, the constitutions, and the canons that have to be voted on by clergy and laity. That's a tension. There's a tension between, we call them vestries, you call them councils, Tom, the local folks who are elected in New England parishes and elsewhere um, to make decisions with the rector at the table. They have a lot of the authority there. It has been said that New England parishes exhibit a distinct congregationalism. I would assume that is true of most Episcopal parishes throughout, that the, the congregation, the parish, the local structure becomes the place of identity and substance and nurture. And it's not surprising that that is the place. There's a tension with something that we all have experienced in various ways called clericalism. I define that as mutually disabling relationships formed of devaluation of laity and exaggeration of clerical status. Both clergy and laity do it. Mutually disabling relationships formed of devaluation of laity and exaggeration of clerical status. So in this Episcopally, Episcopally led and uh, convention governance or synodical governance structure that we have, there are tensions. There's no, there's no question about that. But if a bishop wants a budget, it's got to be passed by the diocesan convention in which the clerical and lay deputies vote. Um, on standing committee, if we see a case of abuse, and we have cases of abuse in our uh, realm and family, as we all, uh, I, I believe we all do, it's the standing committee that hears that with the bishop and works on dealing with that. The, the problem in wider Anglicanism 
is a mixed bag, and let me just say a few things about it because it may hold some um, uh, promise or negative example for you all. In North America, synodical government became normal. In fact, I think the Canadians do it best. They have bishops, clergy, and laity meet together in one house. This is less posturing for the bishops. You know, it's harder to lie in front of your people, right? It's, you don't get on a stump in front of other bishops. When you've got all your folks there, they're going to vote on your bishop and some of your appointments and elect people to your standing committee. Um, there's strong governance, synodical governance structures of unicameral, one-camera houses in other parts of the Anglican Communion. But throughout much of Africa and Asia, since the Church of England did not lead the way, synodical governance involving laity came belatedly. The Church of England did not have a synod that admitted laity until 1969. When I inquired of a good friend of mine with whom I served on an Anglican um, International Commission on Governance, um, didn't they miss the voice of the laity, the authority of the laity uh, in their governance structure? And he said, but Frederica, you have the queen. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I have the queen. Um, that's one lay person. That's a certain kind of um, patronizing, I suppose, approach to governance. Um, today, England Synod meets in three separate houses, bishops, clergy, and laity. All must concur, and that's what's holding up votes on ordination of women um, to the episcopate, which fortunately we passed the same time we admitted women to the priesthood. We said, Let's just throw in the Episcopate, right? It's, it's one of the orders. It's one of the three orders. Let's put it on the table. Some folks said it'll never pass if you put that in. We said, well, let's try. So um, fortunately, we were able to elect the first woman bishop in the diocese of, for the Anglican Communion in the Diocese of Massachusetts. Uh, and the problem uh, worldwide is that other countries who are not culturally adept at democratic measures or inclined that way often use Episcopal leadership to enrich their family, their ethnic group, or their social class and overlook the governance of synods, clergy, and laity. And so overseas, some Anglican um, synods and provinces are asking, is election, is competitive election always the best way? Is a competitive, costly election always the best way, especially when elections are characterized by threats, inducements, deadlocks, and sometimes imprisonment? Still, in the American experience, there's no question that our bishops have to be transparent with us because they meet with us in decision-making councils. I'm not saying people don't give them deference. It is quite distinct, and, as, and albeit, to laity. But the authority, authoritative voice of the laity is now standard in this, con in this country. Um, it needs to be observed with diligence and supported as we go forward. But there's some promising um, directions in this church uh, for handling tensions. And we're working with our colleagues abroad to make sure that that synodical structure uh, comes through. And even the Church of England, God bless her, our mother church, is learning that you can make decisions with laity and governance. And if the Church of England can, can learn that, I'd like to suggest to you any old church can learn that. <laughs> if you don't know where you're going, you're likely to end up somewhere else. So start with the authority of the laity and governance. Thank you.